Welcome to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. This is where courage becomes contagious. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca, former government watchdog and candidate for U.S. Senate in Alaska, currently the chair of the Trump campaign in Alaska, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Nikki Chewbacca, who was formerly a civil rights attorney at the Department of Justice. We're excited to bring you Stand from the Last Frontier of Alaska. You can join us at standshow.org where you can find all of our episodes. Make sure to hit subscribe on our social media pages or at one of your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Today we have an exciting episode for you. We're going to be commenting on the Trump trial, some latest exposures from a whistleblower from Google, and an interesting election that has happened in Alaska that has some consequences for voter turnout across the country. Let's get started. Last Thursday, Nikki Chewbacca, President Trump was convicted on 34 counts of interfering with the 2016 election. So we want to break down for our audience the top five takeaways of this trial for you in case you haven't been following it. Number one, this trial hinges solely on the testimony of Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen. It's the only evidence that they have for these counts. This guy is a serial perjurer, a liar, and a thief. He's lied to the Senate. He's lied to the House. He's lied to federal judges. He's lied to state judges. He's lied to his own attorney. He's lied to his family. And then he stole from the Trump organization because he was angry and mad. He's got an ax to grind with President Trump because he was pissed off that he didn't get appointed to the Trump administration in 2016. And that anger and bitterness has been driving him ever since. And he probably didn't get appointed because he's got some serious credibility issues. So this case rests on the single phone call that Michael Cohen made to allegedly to President Trump, but actually the defense said and proved that this was based on a text message he sent to Trump's bodyguard saying, I'm getting these prank phone calls, I need to talk to you about it. Bodyguard says, call me, the call happens, that's less than 90 seconds. Therefore they showed, that's like the amount of time it takes to leave a voicemail, there's no way the phone could have been passed to President Trump. You could have explained that Stormy Daniels was threatening to go public and ruin his reputation on some made-up claim and gotten his approval for some big hush money payout. And that was the entire case. So now Trump is facing over 100 years in prison solely based on the word of this Michael Cohen. Remember, the standard in a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt. And it seems like there's a lot of doubt left here of whether this actually happened. Yeah, I mean, a lot of doubt is is an understatement, I think. That was generous on your part. Uh, the judge has also fined Trump multiple times and threatened criminal punishment if he criticized witnesses or the judicial process or what was happening in the courtroom. That was a blatant and brazen violation of President Trump's First Amendment rights. I mean, imagine that. Fining him for exercising a constitutional right. And the first of our constitutional rights, the foundation to our constitutional rights, right? The right to free speech. And on top of that, to make things worse, the judge also put Trump and his team, not only putting them under a gag order, uh, he let the prosecution and their team say whatever they wanted. And their witnesses say whatever they wanted. Michael Cohen was on TikTok, on cable news TV, saying whatever he wanted. The whole point was to tip the scales and silence Trump. There was no credible, in my opinion, uh, no credible, justifiable reason, much less a legal reason, uh, for Trump's First Amendment rights to have been curtailed and violated in that way. I think that's going to be an appealable issue in this case. So not only did they throw out the Constitution, but it also seems like our entire American judicial system has been deeply eroded by what just happened. There was never any plausible evidence that Trump actually committed these crimes and no legal basis for the DA's indictment. In fact, the Justice Department under Joe Biden passed on this case a while ago because it said there's no case here. So the integrity of our judicial system has been absolutely threatened and undermined by what Biden and Bragg and their team have done in this reckless zeal to destroy Trump and try and manipulate the outcome of this 2024 election. Biden and Bragg have unleashed an absolutely horrendous abuse of power through the judicial and the executive branches. They've established a new norm here. Here we've got this case of prosecuting your political opponents, even if the charges are baseless, And then we'll see if they get overturned on appeal. But in the meantime, you get the results you want. So if you can't beat your opponent at the ballot box, 
you can just try and beat them at the jury box. And at least through the delayed court system, you get the outcome that you want. It's appalling. And it poses a grave danger to our democratic norms. Yeah, it, re- it really is dangerous. I mean, the left uh, with Biden at the helm is quickly transforming our nation from being a shining city on a hill to a smoldering city in ruins. Uh, None of us wants to live in a country where political prosecution, or should we, I mean, really more appropriately said persecution, uh, becomes as normal as, as, as eggs for breakfast, right? Like, it becomes the norm. None of us wants to get used to living in that kind of a uh, post, post-democracy post society. Uh, fortunately, and here's the good news, uh, we can still reverse course. I don't know how much longer we have. Um, it's, we, we don't have a infinite running lane here to recross this Rubicon that we've crossed, but we can still reverse course in November. We, the people, run this country, not some... DA in New York City or, you know, a judge in New York City, all of whom were biased, uh, clearly biased uh, against uh, Trump. This was totally, and pun intended here, a trumped up charge. Uh, We have an opportunity uh, to take a stand for freedom and justice at the ballot box in November. And here in Alaska, we're going to be taking the last stand for freedom at the ballot box come November. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There is a great opportunity for government by the people to really come out strong here and say, we don't agree with this. As to to your point number four, this was a horrific case of forum shopping. We're going to throw all of these cases, all these indictments, all these charges at Trump. We're just going to see what sticks. And you know, it really hasn't stuck across the U.S., but this one happened to stick. It is unlikely to stick through the appeal process. And People are saying at this point it'll take longer than the election to see the outcome of that appeal. And in the meantime, we're going to have an election and America gets to decide what the outcome is. But forum shopping until you get to persecute your political opponent the way that you want is not how our country is founded. And it is not what the check and balance uh, system of the three branches of government was intended for. Mm -hmm. And so that is uh, what we the people get to be the ultimate check and balance on our system of government, on the establishment. That's what the vote of the people is. And so that takes us to number five. It is so critical in this time where we have heated passion and so many people trying to divide us that people who support President Trump, and I would say people who support a way forward in America that is calm and peaceful, that we actually stay calm and get involved in positive ways. I even see now in this week that has passed a lot of effort by the media to try and stoke the fire and make it seem like things are worse than it is. Oh, Trump is doing horribly. Oh, the polls are so bad. Oh, he's lost support when in fact, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, he's actually leading in the polls in all the swing states. He's doing great in his election and he's leading in fundraising. So the the message and the narrative is there and designed to get people upset and to get us mad. And in fact, what we need to do is get involved in the positive ways that are actually within how the system works. Donate, volunteer, campaign, and especially vote. Mm-hmm. There are so many people who choose to stay voiceless because they won't vote. Your vote is your voice. So we can stop the spread of injustice and corruption that we're seeing simply by getting involved. To paraphrase what Benjamin Franklin said, we still have a republic if we can keep it. Yeah, I really, I really uh, think that's that's a wonderful way to put it. That that we still have a a way to turn all this around, and we still have lots of things that that we can do. Uh, we need to remember that, like I said earlier, there there are a lot of appealable issues in this case, and this case will get overturned eventually. The problem is, it's most likely going to get overturned uh, if you have to go through the state court system after this election. Uh, But we can send a resounding message uh, to those who would seek to use the the levers of power to uh, enshrine themselves and ensconce themselves in uh, in the White House, uh, in positions of power, uh, that that's not how America works. That's not who we are. That's not who we want to be. And we're going to change that because America is to be run by and for we the people.
So Absolutely. Yeah. So those are our top five takeaways from the trial. And I want to take you to something that happened inside the trial, just so you get a take of it. Our friend Alan Dershowitz was there. He is Trump's former impeachment attorney, and he's coming to Alaska on June 27th. You can get your tickets to see him on our website, standshow.org. This is what he said. So he is a Democrat, and he was there to see how this trial actually went. He was horrified at what he saw. He said the judge actually threatened to strike all of the defense's leading witnesses testimony this guy's name was costello he's an attorney the attorney former attorney for cohen he's the judge trying to strike all of costello's testimony because costello raised his eyebrows at the judge so if he raised his eyebrows again he's going to strike all of his testimony that of course would have been unconstitutional dershowitz wrote because it would have denied the defendant trump his sixth amendment right to confront witnesses and to raise the defense it would have punished the defendant for something a witness was accused of doing Even if what Costello did was wrong, and it was not, it would be utterly improper and unlawful to strike his testimony, testimony that undercut and contradicted the government's star witness, meaning Cohen. The judge's threat was absolutely outrageous, unethical, unlawful, and petty. There you have a report from Alan Dershowitz is considered America's greatest lawyer, a Democrat, reporting from inside the courtroom what he saw about this abuse of power. That's what happened, and that's why so many people are saying what you said, Nikki. This is likely to be overturned. Yeah, America's greatest defense attorney. So we're coming up on a break, and we'll see you right after this. Stand by. We're at standshow.org. That's where you can get your tickets to see Alan Dershowitz live if you're in Alaska. And make sure to hit subscribe so you can follow all of our great shows. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. Let's talk about the Trump trial from last week and what a dark day in history it was. There are so many things about that that give Americans great concern about the state of our American judicial system and how political opponents can persecute you through the establishment and the the power that they have to leverage the power of the executive and the judicial together to affect the outcome of an election. That said, I don't hear a lot of people talking about the positives from that day. And I wanted to recap some of those for our audience because there were positives that have happened because of the trial. So let's talk about that. Number one, fundraising has been absolutely epic for President Trump and for the RNC. Off the hook. Absolutely. And fundraising is how you win campaigns. So for people who are wondering how this whole process works as somebody who ran for an election. You can't power a campaign and election very well if you don't have money. I know that we have some of these outlier stories like the trucker in New York or New Jersey who won uh, buying pizza or donuts. Remember that story from a couple years ago when he got a seat in the state legislature? But usually the way that you win a campaign is you've got to have money to do things like pay for your ads and pay for marketing. You got to pay for the mail that goes out. You've got to pay for the events that you have, like the rallies we see President Trump going to. And that stuff costs. And it really relies on the power of donors. And the real effectiveness of a campaign is measured by what we call the small donors, not by the the packs that come in or the dark money that comes in, but by the power of the grassroots donor, because that shows the actual support a candidate has. So for the month of May, Trump and the RNC broke fundraising records for a month and raised over $140 million. And a lot of that came in right at the end because of the trial. And you were just telling me some new numbers. Yeah. So Fox was reporting uh, that, as of the verdict, um, he's actually raised over two hundred million dollars now since the beginning of June. Yeah, since the beginning the of June. Yeah, and, and the, since the beginning of June. Uh, since uh, yeah, since the verdict up to now, uh, beginning of June, over two hundred million dollars. Over two hundred million dollars. That's more than any other candidate for office in history. That's has, amazing. Has raised and in that same amount of time. I read something like. Is it 20, 23% of the people who've been donating? 30%. Are small donors? And then how many of them are new donors? No, 30% uh, of those of those small donations were 
first time donors to the Trump, just, Trump to a Trump campaign. That is mind blowing. Yep. So you'll read online, especially from outlets that are against President Trump, that he's losing support. All these people, you know, this money percentage would say they wouldn't vote for him again. However, the fundraising number shows something completely different. If you've got that many people who've never donated to a political candidate before, putting their money where their mouth is, that that's a vote. And not only that, but the way that we think of it in the political world is that's also a circle of influence. That person is, in, is saying, not only am I going to put my money there, but that's now a public donation and I'm going public with my support. And so now I'm going to tell my family and my friends and I'm going to be an influencer for this campaign. So you've just made a little campaigner, if you will, out of that person who just donated. That's a really big deal. Another thing I think is positive is the change in public opinion. So we've seen that there's a little bit of a toss up in some of these seven swing states. The swing states are going to decide the election. I know every state matters. I'm a little bit partial to the state of Alaska for those who know me. However, in this particular race in 2024, the reality is the seven swing states are going to decide this election. Nikki Chewbacca, what are those seven swing states? <laughs> those, swag, those seven swing states, Kelly Chewbacca, uh, include Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Previously, we had some on there like Ohio and others. But some of those states, Ohio, Florida, used to be swing states for those who have like a 20-year track record of being in politics. But they have now shifted. Ohio and Florida are solid Republican states now. And so these are the toss-up states this year that we're all watching for the presidential race. There are some congressional races like Alaska mm -hmm. that are actually your toss-up states. This is one of our top congressional seats for the toss-ups actually up here this year. But for the presidential race, it's in those seven states. So really, the only polls we need to watch are in those seven states. Well, I would also add, we're seeing some blue states that, that might be in play now. I mean, uh, New York is now, I mean, he has shrunk that lead to a single digit lead for Biden in right. New amazing. York, which is, which is just like amazing. And then you've got Virginia, which may be in play now as well. Uh, so the race is starting to tighten and it likely, it likely will tighten more uh, as the summer progresses and people start paying attention, especially post uh, the GOP and Democrat uh, conventions. Well, and with the big Hunter Biden trial starting. So remember, it was the yep. it was Comey announcing that the investigation was continuing against Hillary Clinton that really shifted the outcome of the trial or the outcome of the uh, election between Trump and Hillary Clinton at the time. These whatever's the most recent thing on people's mind tends to affect the outcome of the election. And I, I don't think that the Hunter Biden trial is going to go well for the Biden family, nor do I think they're going to handle the questions or the public media around that very well. But I want to get back to the swing states. It turns out for those who care about these numbers in all seven swing states, as of this week, Trump is leading in those seven swing states. So don't believe the negative media from the fake news outlets that want to tell you Trump's in jeopardy, he should fold, he should quit, he should yield to a better candidate without baggage, whatever all of that is. It's all just some of that inflammatory news to try and stir up and divide Americans. The fact is Trump is leading in all seven states, all seven states, which is a complete flip from just a couple years ago. That's a big deal. Yep. And I mean, the 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 race is still probably going to be tight. Right. We know like totally. he, right now he's about one point ahead of Biden overall, which, again, is pretty is pretty big. So it's it's going to come down, at least at this point, to less than 60,000 votes, potentially in those states, in those states. So uh, we've still got our work cut out for us, uh, for those who support Trump and quite frankly, for those who support a better America going forward, making America great again. And you know what? That's not people associate that uh, or have in the past with, you know, something evil or something awful. But that's another piece that we're seeing positive coming out of this trial is folks who might have called themselves never Trumpers um, are now realizing that this is bigger than President Trump. And he has said this himself, that this is bigger than him. Um, everything that that the Biden administration has done to to basically uh, erode our institutions in these last uh, three and a half years um, is impacting Americans in such tragic and difficult ways 
people are finally realizing, you know what? We want America to be great again because when America's great, we're doing great. This isn't about uh, some sort of evil genius who's trying to hurt our country. Uh, this is about a, a leader who is strong, who loves our country, who believes that our best years can be ahead of us, and who has put himself in front of the metaphorical firing squad uh, for Americans, for this country, to push us into and to lead us into a better and brighter future. And Americans are uh, increasingly uh, coalescing around that truth, that reality, and I think we're going to continue to see increased momentum behind the president. Well, I think that increased momentum will also help us with down ballot races. So the presidential yeah. race is not the only race in play this election cycle. And as you're saying, this really is not about President Trump. This really is about the direction of America. And are we going to swing to this far left progressive agenda that is taking us down this socialist, communist kind of blended society that is really eroding everything that America stands for? Or are we going to swing back to something that really stands on our values as an American society where this government is actually led by the people and not by institutions partnering with big tech and social media to tell us what to think and how to think and why to think and then controlling us and controlling our pocketbooks. And instead, we tell them who's actually in charge here. And instead, the power is in community engagement and individual empowerment. That momentum, I think, that this this trial and these convictions has kind of caused an awakening for a lot of Americans to go, wait a minute, I need to be involved. I need to do something. I think that could be very positive for our congressional races, for our local races, and very beneficial for like the trajectory going forward. And so I'm very hopeful, actually, that we will see really um, good-hearted American candidates being elected in all jurisdictions and all states across the country to really set us back into a balanced path going forward. That, that momentum, I think, is really, really good. And I think that that's what our worldview for our audience, that's what our worldview really leads us towards. We really believe in a positive worldview, not one that's like, let's just give up, let's just surrender, let's just quit, let's throw in the towel, or let's get hostile, let's get angry. Instead, if we're going to have hope, it's got to be a perseverant hope. It's got to be based in something. But my worldview is based on the story of the gospel. And I really believe that after really, really horrible things happen, where people thought it was the end of the story on Good Friday, that God brought back our resurrection story. That's what I believe. I believe that really great things can happen after really, really bad things. And that's what I believe can happen here. I believe that instead of giving up hope and going back to doing whatever we could do, our worldview says that really good things can happen after really bad things. And that's what we're going to hope for, because God can do great things. Yeah, cynicism is not going to help us. That's right. Um, and defeatism also isn't going to help us. Um, but I love how Laura Ingram has put it on her show. She has said, don't get mad, get motivated. And I think that's a that's a great way uh, to put it for, for all of us. It's uh, going forward. We say we're not going to become cynical. We're going to still be hopeful, and we are now motivated to uh, support the president and support uh, the um, the vision we have for a free, democratic United States of America going forward. That isn't what uh, the Democrats, uh, the more darker vision that the the leftists and the Democratic Party are trying to put forward for us. Absolutely, we're up against a break. Stand by. We'll be right back here with Kelly, Nikki, Chewbacca on stand. Go to standshow.org and hit subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform or on YouTube, our social media channels. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We're excited to bring you this story. Thanks to our friends at the Next News Network for sharing this with us. Nikki Chewbacca, I want to share this story with you, and I want to get your thoughts on it. No problem, Kelly Chewbacca. All right. <laughs> so last Wednesday, the Texas Senate Committee on State Affairs held this crucial hearing on maintaining election security, featuring explosive testimony from Google whistleblower Zach Voorhees, Ryan Hartwig, a Facebook whistleblower, and Dr. Robert Epstein and Dan Schneider, who's the vice president of the Media Research Center. In a shocking revelation, Voorhees, who's a former Google engineer, 
He developed a and delivered a bombshell testimony shedding light on Google's alleged efforts to interfere with elections and maintain a biased information landscape. Voorhees exposed Google's secret machine learning fairness program, if you haven't heard of it. He claims it's aimed at programming the public to align with the tech giant's corporate values. This is what he said. Watch this video. Make no mistake, machine learning fairness is and has always been the real censorship program, and it is massive. The goal was to, quote, program the public to align with Google's corporate values. Those are their words. Uh, this was a four-step process laid out by the AI ethicist, Margaret Mitchell, who has since been fired for um, unethical behavior. Step one, training data are collected and classified. Step two, algorithms are programmed. Step three, media are filtered, ranked, aggregated, or generated. And step four, people like us are programmed. That's a direct quote from their slides. And it wasn't just in one slide, it was littered throughout the company. This process was repeated in a cycle, with step four feeding back into step one. This sounds like something out of a conspiracy theory, but it's real. Google rewrote their news algorithms, specifically trained on mainstream media stories targeting Trump, such as his fight with Comey. Systems like real-time events, real-time boost, and hive mind assign higher amplification scores to stories related to targeting Trump. Google's internal documents revealed their stance on, quote, algorithmic unfairness. So they stated that even factually accurate representations could be considered algorithmically unfair and removed. So let me just quote them, quote Google for a minute. For example, imagine a Google image query for CEOs shows predominantly men, which, by the way, Mr. Chewbacca, is true. I've been in those boardrooms. Even if it were a factually accurate representation of the world, it would be algorithmic unfairness. In some cases, it might even be appropriate to take no action if the system accurately reflects current reality, while in other cases, it may be desirable to consider how we might help society reach a more fair and equitable state via either product intervention or broader corporate social responsibility efforts, end quote. What that means is they would replace the pictures of all those men with pictures of diverse looking women to change what a boardroom looks like. Voorhees also alleged rampant censorship and bias. He said that Google is specifically targeting conservative news outlets. Whoa, shock. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but watch what he says here. Let's talk about news ranking. News sites that supported Democrats were ranked with the highest quality and trustworthiness. Here's a partial list. Wall Street Journal, 8.53. CBS News, 6.57. CNN, 6.0. Fox News 5.2, Russia Today 4.57, The Young Turks 2.53, Alex Jones Network negative 1.56. At the bottom of the list is Next News Network at negative 3.35. Let me reiterate, the foreign propaganda outlet Russia Today was scored seven points higher than the Next News Network one of the top YouTube news networks in America. Since my disclosure, Next News Network has been permanently demonetized and will soon be bankrupted. These sound more like the actions we'd expect from a Russian propaganda complex. But shockingly, it's the actions of Google. So according to Voorhees, who was invited to testify by the Heritage Foundation, Google employs blacklists, skewed search rankings, and algorithmic unfairness in order to suppress right-leaning content. So then Voorhees calls for a subpoena to uncover Google's clandestine operations, which has never happened before, including this machine learning fairness program, the blacklist, media ranking documents, and the decision process behind demonetizing Next News Network. When asked what recommendations would you have for the legislature to take action to address the issues you address, this is what he said. My recommendation is uh, subpoenas would be filed uh, against Google for any um, documents that have the name blacklist.txt related to Google, uh, YouTube, you. um, and their uh, news uh, search corpuses. Um, I would also ask that you subpoena um, their documents related to rankings of media outlets. 
Um, I've provided a supplemental uh, showing a slide deck including such a list um, that is four years old. It's a bit dated. Uh, the open question now is what are the updated rankings of the uh, media outlets that they have? Um, also, um, you know, machine learning fairness is so huge. I don't even know how you would even swallow that. But if you could do, like, you know, ask them, file a subpoena, ask them for documents related to machine learning fairness. And that is going to be such a huge bombshell that it just needs to get into the public disclosure. So it's those three things, machine learning fairness, blacklists, and uh, their media rankings is just is, is the start of the entire. Um, what might be a really cheap way to get at this information is to ask what the decision process was for demonetizing Next News Network, right? Like they're very large. And if you can get that information related to that case, I think that that's going to um, sort of illuminate what their decision-making processes were for that demonetization. Like they're still demonetized. They've been demonetized for like six months, like the top conservative news network on YouTube. And the question is, why did they get demonetized? And if we have the answer to that, we're going to get the answers to a whole bunch of other like um, censorship activities with the company. And then right after that, Senator Brian Hughes took bold action and he ordered the subpoenas. So in response to shocking revelations from Google whistleblower Zach Voorhees, the Senate Committee on State Affairs unanimously voted to authorize subpoenas to big tech firms like Facebook and Google. But one of my favorite parts of the story is how Voorhees reacted because he made these disclosures clear as a whistleblower like many years ago, when it was like five years ago, if you've been following this story, and nothing's happened. It's gotten a lot of media coverage, but otherwise no action's been taken. So check out this video of him on his Twitter account where he has his reaction to what the Texas legislature did. I just want to let you guys know that it's been five years of fighting and I've got nothing but media to show for it until today. The Senate... The Texas Senate has finally taken legal action and authorized subpoenas, and I'm so happy. It's been five years, and now this has come out of nowhere, and I just hope and pray that other state senates will take up the call and investigate these big tech companies. You deserve a democracy and a representation and your vote, and these people are trying to subvert it and I couldn't live with myself knowing that this was happening. Thank you for everyone who's believed in me through the years. I feel like we're on the verge of something absolutely huge. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you so much. So Voorhees exposed Google's alleged bias and censorship, specifically targeting conservative news outlets like Next News Network, which has been demonetized for over six months as a result of what YouTube and Google have done. The mounting evidence presented in this hearing suggests that these tech giants impose their own biases to manipulate and stifle dissenting voices, undermining the very foundation of our democratic process. There seems to be a theme here. Senator Hughes and the committee made it clear, though, that Texas isn't going to stand for this, while this, these big tech giants threaten the integrity of our elections. It's time for big tech to answer for their actions and face consequences for their alleged election interference. I'm really proud of Texas and the stand that they took, and I really hope other states do the, the, do the same. As Texas continues its investigation into election security and the role of big tech, Voorhees' testimony has actually ignited a fierce debate around the need for transparency and accountability in the tech industry. Our integrity of elections is at stake, so it's crucial that the public remains informed and vigilant. And it's our prayer that this compels YouTube to re-monetize Next News Network and any other of the conservative channels that were monetized for years until truth became treason in this empire of lies. Nikki Chewbacca, comments? <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, it doesn't come as any surprise that they've been doing this. We sure. know that they've been doing this for a while. It's just, it's not, it's great that um, there is teeth to all of this and it's beginning to pick up steam. I think that more than the integrity of our elections is at stake, right? This because this, this is more than just about the elections. This they are using these search engines and these social media platforms to, as part of a uh, 
of an a, approach to to reshape our culture, to reshape Correct. how people think, um, and they're they're using all, their algorithms to influence us. Um, and I think it's it's dangerous. It's super dangerous, and it's it's not just dangerous. It also is part of what is undermining our democracy, right? When when you have a tech giant uh, that is basically unfettered and seems to have unfettered power to do whatever it wants um, in influencing how Americans think and shaping how Americans think, using their own personal biases, wow. I mean, that's dark. That's 1984. Right. <laughs> right. When these these standards also are not apparent and clear in the community use standards, right? Yep. Like no hate speech, no bullying, also nothing that we agree with politically. <laughs> but I recently was watching a clip from an interesting podcast called Leaving the Left for Liberty. And she was making the interesting point that she was re chronicling all of the things that Google and YouTube have suppressed. For example, the lab leak theory that the COVID virus actually originated from a lab in Wuhan, China. And for the longest time, that was a taboo thing to say on social media. And if you said that on YouTube or you said that on one of the social media platforms, your posts were taken down, your channel was demonetized, you were blacklisted because that was considered something absolutely fabricated and misinformation and she said, now that's considered widely corroborated information. That's a fact. We know that the COVID virus came from the Wuhan lab. And so here we actually have, she cited several, but proven examples where they punished Americans, demonetized them, which means killing, in many cases, people's jobs and livelihoods. And businesses, right? During, and businesses. during a, a crisis that was already killing other businesses. During a public health crisis yeah. where people needed critical information because they were pushing an agenda of information and suppressing free speech that actually turned out to be true. They were the ones perpetuating and peddling the misinformation and disinformation intentionally and dangerously often in corroboration with the federal government. This is what we're actually talking about. And so the fact that it has taken this Google engineer whistleblower years, half a decade to get one state legislature to subpoena Google for its recent records, he made the point, I don't know where things are with the machine learning program and the blacklist and everything now, but things are probably updated and changed. We need so many states to jump on this bandwagon. I would love to see the Department of Justice jump on it, but I think that's unlikely under this current administration. But again, November is just around the corner, y'all. And we've got <laughs> such a great opportunity for we the people to do something about it. Here at Stand, we believe in freedom and truth and government by the people. And that's the things that we stand for. So this is another story we wanted to bring you on an issue we can take a stand on. These elections are important. And so is holding big tech accountable. Free thinking is the most important thing that we have and the greatest check on uh, power um, that's out there. That's why the First Amendment is the First Amendment, free speech, right? It's the most important. Yep. So we're up against a break. We'll be so happy to see you right after this. Stand by with Nikki and Kelly Chewbacca. We're at standshow.org. That's where you can get your tickets to see Alan Dershowitz live in Alaska on June 27th. If you're in Anchorage, fantastic. If not, what a great time to come to Alaska for a vacation and see us. We have limited tickets available, standshow.org. Pick up your tickets today and make sure to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube, on our social media channels. We'd love to have you as one of our standouts. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. Nikki Chewbacca, let's talk about voter turnout in elections. So recently we had an election here in Anchorage for the mayor race. I wanna set it up for all of our viewers who might not know the details. We have an incumbent mayor who is a Republican. He was elected several years ago in the middle of the COVID crisis because our very left, far left assembly 
had just gone too far and had implemented mask mandates and school shutdowns and business shutdowns and city shutdowns. And Anchorage responded and said, no more shutdowns. And the most conservative candidate in a very flooded field of mayoral candidates was elected. And so he's been our incumbent the last three years. Now, he has had to deal with a legislature that has a supermajority and veto override power that is far left. So that's kind of been the balance in Anchorage. So we just had another election. And in this particular election, the far left candidate won. So the challenger won. So now we, we've just gone completely blue as a city. And of course, Anchorage is the largest city in Alaska. And this is a very interesting case study for the rest of the country because uh, there is a great effort, of course, to turn the West Coast into the left coast. And Alaska remains the only red-ish state on the West Coast. And so we are standing on the, the front edge of the tide there, trying to keep everything from the whole left, the whole West Coast from turning left. But what really happened in this situation, I think, was a case study in voter turnout. Why didn't the voters come out to vote? I don't believe that Anchorage is actually more Democrat than Republican. I do think that we are pretty on the fence, but there's still more right-leaning voters and there are left-leaning voters. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had the result that we had during the COVID um, the COVID pandemic for this mayor race. So what happened here? In this particular situation, in this runoff race, because neither of them got enough votes to actually win, so it went to a runoff, we had a 12% lower turnout than in the runoff race that this mayor had three years ago. So we had a significant voter drop-off than the last mayoral runoff race. I think that that's really telling for 2024 and interesting for people who are looking at the 2024 November race and what that could mean. We also had record low voter turnout in Alaska for the November 2022 race. So we are having a voter drop-off problem in Alaska. And we're all very concerned about voter suppression, I think, across the United States and in various forms. One of the ways that I think votes can get suppressed is by people choosing to not exercise their vote. Just choosing to not vote is a form of suppressing the vote. When the election is actually chosen by a very, very small minority of people making huge decisions for everybody else, that is a form of voter suppression. Because those people are, the, the reasons those people are choosing not to vote is because, you know, fill in the blank. They don't feel like their vote counts. They don't trust the system anymore. Um, you know, so interesting that you would mention that. After the 2022 election, we did a poll, and this is what we found of for people who didn't vote. So interesting things to consider for people. 73% of the people, this is statewide in Alaska, but still bears, uh, bears important information for everybody, I think, across the nation. 73% of the people who answered this poll did not vote. Absolutely verified. Here are some of the things that people said in this poll. 19.3% of them did not vote because they lacked trust in the integrity of the elections or they were concerned about ranked choice voting in Alaska, which is a unique system that we have up here. Interestingly, that was split evenly between people registered as Republicans and Democrats. That didn't lean one way or the other. That's a, that's a huge find. Yeah, that's, that was interesting to us. 55% said that ranked choice voting was more complex and affected their vote. 34% said the Dobbs decision that happened in 2022 affected their decision whether or not to vote. The Dobbs decision being the, the reversal of Roe v. Wade. The decision to put Roe v. Wade down to the, from federal decision to the state. So every state gets to make its own decision about implementing Roe v. Wade. So we know that these large policy decisions across the United States actually do have an impact on whether people decide to vote or not. Like some, one of the things that we saw for my race is 5,000 right-leaning voters whose single issue that they vote on is pro-life issues. They did not vote, and they're, they're super voters. They did not vote in 2022. And potentially the reason is because they figured, the, well, the issue's over. We got Roe v. Wade overturned. In fact, Roe v. Wade's not overturned. Here in Alaska, you can abort a baby all the way up to it being delivered on the delivery table. And so Roe v. Wade is alive and active in Alaska. However, these 5,000 pro-life voters did not vote. And so they said the Dobbs decision affected their decision whether to vote, 55%. 
uh, or sorry, 34 percent, 28 percent said their frustration about Alaska election systems affected their decision to vote. And 22 percent said negative media coverage affected their decision to vote. So to your point, there are all kinds of reasons why people might decide to not vote. But these are some of the things that I know are affecting our significant voter drop off in Alaska that people are still scratching their heads about trying to figure out how to get people to vote. And it absolutely affected our outcome in 2022. It definitely affected the outcome of this mayor race because by all accounts, the incumbent had the advantage in this race and has more of a base in this race and could have been able to win had the voter turnout been there. And I am concerned, the reason I'm bringing this up, I am concerned that without planning, if we just think, well, there don't people are donating to Trump, people are donating to congressional candidates, there's a lot of passion on social media, but if we don't do the hard work of mobilizing the vote and making clear your vote matters, every vote matters, then we will actually forfeit races. And and then there goes the entire um, the entire point of doing all the work that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's the work is important, but ultimately it's sealed by our vote. Absolutely. And by the additional votes that we get for the things that we're passionate about and the cause, the causes that we're passionate about. Uh, I and I can I think I can speak for both of us. We don't want to see voter suppression on either side, right? It's cons- That's it's, as, it's as concerning to me to see that there was a drop off in uh, people voting on the Democrat side as it was on the Republican side because um, I know this is probably not popular to say in these days, but uh, we need to have a a system with more than just one party rule. <laughs> That's how we balance things out. It's 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 another form of uh, of of balancing political power and making sure that uh, different ideas that are, are are considered and the best ideas rise to the service and the candidates with the best ideas rise to the service. We don't want a one party system. Uh, we have a one party system here in in Anchorage, um, and that is not a good thing. And we don't want a one party system to happen at the federal level because we've seen uh, what's happened when. Uh, the Biden administration and the leftists who control it have had uh, essentially uh, un, unfettered uh, authority and power to do whatever they wanted. I mean, they've been pretty brazen in completely ignoring the Constitution on, on so many issues. Absolutely. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the the folks in, uh, in power in our in our city, right, not right now, but who are coming into power, I'm I'm concerned. Uh, we're going to be seeing some more violations of people's constitutional constitutional rights, like we saw with COVID. They did not hesitate to to violate people's constitutional rights and their ability to to just live to survive. We had uh, we had one restaurant here in town that that um, got fines uh, from the city and the could, fines. yeah, because they they were refusing to shut down. Because guess what? People still needed to eat and. People still needed to to live. Their businesses still needed to. Uh, the businesses were their sole source of income, right? And and now we know after all of that that these draconian um, lockdowns were unnecessary and incredibly destructive. And I would say, at the end of the day, not to get totally off topic, but uh, this is what happens when um, you don't have d- voices listening to each other in a balanced dialogue on these things. Um, it was pretty clear to many of us that these these policy decisions weren't only unconstitutional and violating people's constitutional rights. They weren't going to get the you know purported results, and um, and so this is why we want to have people on both sides voting um, and people engaged in a positive way, not in a destructive way, in a positive way, uh, so that we can get back to the regular order of business here in America. I would also add, as someone who has reviewed the election system in Alaska, so there's not a lot of people who can go around saying they've done an audit or review of a statewide election system. The concerns about election integrity are understandable, but we can't wait for an election system to be pure and flawless before we vote. 
I think every election system is going to have some issues with it because every election system has humans at the at the root of it. And so we need to shore up and build some protections and guards around the election system as much as we can. But we don't say, I'm not going to participate or not vote because there might be some flaws or vulnerabilities around a system. That's just, you know, what if you said that about your bank? <laughs> You're just not going to do any banking transactions because there could be some vulnerabilities. And instead, we need to participate and to vote. And also what I've seen is that a lot of these vulnerabilities can absolutely be, if you will, overridden or um, snowed over by voter turnout. A light turnout makes it a lot easier for bumps in the system to be felt and to be noticed in an election. But a huge turnout makes it much, much harder for people to mess with or for errors in the system to come to the surface and actually affect the outcome of an election. And so really, I think one of the antidotes until you get to the kind of system where you have a lot of confidence and trust in it, one of the antidotes to it is voter turnout. So if you're one of the people who's like, I don't trust the system, good, go vote. That's exactly what you need to do because your vote is part of what insulates the system from its vulnerabilities. It's just my two cents there. You're on stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We appreciate our standouts. Make sure to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform on YouTube and follow us on social media. You can find all of that at standshow.org. Nikki Chewbacca, that's also where our friends can get the tickets to the Alan Dershowitz event that we will be having in Anchorage on June 27th. Come hear him live talk about the fight for freedom in Israel and America and his firsthand account at the Trump trial. We'll see you there, standshow.org. See you next time, where courage is contagious.